cambiar vidas, change organizations, change organizations, change the world. So, I'm a Stanford professor and a co-founder of Coursera. Today, most people will never have access to a Stanford class, but we're changing that. Working with universities like Stanford, Princeton, Caltech, Penn, and others, we're taking classes from these top universities and putting them on the web, free for anyone to take. Most of our classes have enrollments of tens of thousands or more of students, and I think we launched the MOOC, or the Massive Open Online Courses Movement, out of Stanford. Before diving into details, let me show you some of the classes we have. Welcome to Calculus. 50 million people are uninsured. Models help us organize information. They help us make better predictions. They help us design more effective institutions and policies. Models, in short, just make us better think. And if we run this, we get unbelievable segregation. So Bush imagined that in the future, you'd wear a camera right in the center of your head. A love poem is a poem about another person. Mills wants the student of sociology to develop the quality. The hanging cable takes on the form of a hyperbolic cosine. For each pixel in the image, set the red to zero. So let's see what that looks like. And that vaccine allowed us to eliminate polio virus. Does Lufthansa serve breakfast in San Jose? Well, that sounds funny. So this is which coin you pick, and this is the key possible. Zero from being passive, so passive becomes a best response. So in large-scale machine learning, So using technology, we're addressing the problem of high quality education at scale. Let me share with you my experience. As a Stanford professor, I normally teach here a 400 student class. Last year, I put my class online and I reached an audience of 100,000 students. To put that number in context, in order to reach a comparable size audience, I would otherwise have had to teach my normal Stanford class for um, 250 years. So, who were the students? It was students like Akash, middle-class family in India, would never have had access to a Stanford course otherwise. Or students like Jenny, 39-year-old single mother of two, who would otherwise not have access to these classes. What made these classes successful? I think first, and, and I guess uh, to report to your current progress, since this project launched about a year ago, 16 universities have announced partnerships with us. Um, since announcing our first set of partnerships in April, we reached a million students about a month ago. We actually reached a million students faster than Facebook. And in the month since then, we've grown another 25%. So why are so many students taking our classes? First and foremost, I think is a notion that they are real causes. So the class begins on a certain date. It runs for a certain fixed period of time, 10 weeks in the case of my class. And um, this is a plot of the amount of web traffic in my class as it ran, those peaks, those heartbeats correspond to when there was a homework due. Uh, so predictably, the 24 hours before a deadline, it spikes, which proves that procrastination is a global phenomenon. Um, and when a student completes the class, they get a certificate or similar from us. Um, this is what the classes look like. Like many others, we use video-based instruction. And this shows students watching the videos to accelerate the playback. Um, English captioning, which is useful for non-native speakers of English, as well as foreign language captioning with our crowdsourced translations. And rather than having hour-long videos, we instead take complex concepts and ask instructors to break them down into short video chunks, thus allowing instructors to post optional prerequisite or optional advanced material, and allowing the students to navigate through the content in their own, at their own pace in their own ordering, move us as, moving us away from the one-size-fits-all model of education. But a class is more than just lectures, and we know that students learn best not by passively listening, but by having opportunities to practice with the material. This is one of my favorite studies that appeared in Science last year that shows that if a student studies the material, they achieve a certain level of performance. If they study repeatedly, repeat, they do a bit better. But it's really the process of being tested on the material, retrieval practice. It's being tested on the material that causes the neural pathways to be formed that correspond to long-term retention. So we built into our courses ample opportunities for students to practice with the material. Let me show you an example with what we call in-video quizzes, which are questions that you get asked right in the middle of a lecture. Prospect theory, hyperbolic discounting, status quo bias, base rate bias, 
They're all well documented. So they're all well documented deviations from. So when the lecture reaches where the yellow notches, the video pauses, and every student is asked a question, you get to submit an answer. Here, a student's not quite right. They correct it, resubmit it, and uh, get to see an optional explanation. And then class moves on. To contrast this with my experience teaching my Stanford class, when I ask a question in class, usually half of my class is still madly scribbling away, trying to write down the last thing I said. Um, maybe about 10% is zoned out on Facebook. And there's, <laughs> and there's always that one smiley pan sitting in the first row that blurts out the answer, and then I feel really good that someone answered my question, and the class moves on. So only one student got to attempt an answer. Ironically, a website can be more interactive where every student gets to attempt an answer, every student gets instant feedback on whether they're getting it. Of course, not all homeworks can be, it's just multiple choice, uh, can be auto-graded. And so in order to enable the more open-ended critical thinking types of exercises, put a lot of work into developing a peer grading system in which students can say write a 300 word essay, every student is trained to grade other students' work, and every student is then responsible for grading say five other students' work, and in exchange they get feedback from five other students about their work. This has been key for, to allow us to offer classes in poetry, humanities, social sciences, and so on. Um, peer grading has been well studied pedagogically to give accurate grades and we've run now by far the largest peer graded classes uh, with tens of thousands of students. When you have hundreds of thousands of students, a community naturally forms around the, the content. It turns out that um, no matter what time of day you're awake thinking about the material, there will be someone in some time zone awake thinking about the same thing as you are. They can discuss it with you. Last year, when a student posted a question on a discussion forum, the median response time to a question was 22 minutes, which is a far better level of service than I ever offered to my students. Um, and in addition to the online community, physical study groups have been organically popping up as well. This picture that we took fairly recently, and students are forming physical communities as well. To wrap up, I've often been asked in the past few months, if you can go online and take a Princeton class for free, why would anyone still pay $200,000 for a Princeton degree? So Mark Twain didn't think college was worth the price of admission. <laughs> but I disagree. Going even further back, here's a different quote by Plutarch, which is that, the mind is not a vessel that needs filling, but wood that needs igniting. I think the real value of attending a top university like Princeton or Catholic at Stanford is not just the content. Content is increasingly free on the web anyway. Instead, I think it's the interactions of the professors, interactions of other equally bright students. So many of the universities working with us, by putting the lectures online and asking students to watch the videos online, are now able to create even more time, more space in the classroom for these interactions, which I think is a real value of attending a top university. Finally, in the last year, half year, I spent a lot of time talking to people about education. I find that even today, a lot of people say that high quality education is only for the elite. A lot of people say that high quality education is only for the privileged. I say that a high quality education is a fundamental human right. And with technology, we're working to bring that to everyone. Thank you. Um, right, so for now, they're getting certificates from us, a, a piece of paper, like a statement of accomplishment and circular of completion. Many of our students are proudly listing their certificates on their resumes and uh, successfully using them to get better jobs. Our partner universities are not offering academic credit, but one interesting development has been that many universities around the world are offering credit for our classes. So we had nothing to do with this. Uh, the University of Helsinki, for example, asked their students to come and take Coursera classes and said, you know, come back and show the Coursera certificate to us and we'll give you a uh, academic credit that is good towards the degree at University of Helsinki. So we had nothing to do with this, but this is slowly growing. I think it's a great development for the students. What do you mean by our universities? At Stanford, American Public University, the private universities, will we ever give credit for this sort of thing? 
You know, I see more and more universities moving in this direction. Uh, University of Washington has also announced that they will be offering four credit classes using this sort of platform with some add-on things. Um, I think we've all seen the numbers about the, the challenges of cost, lack of access, and mixed quality of higher education. If, uh, and we're saddling our graduates with these massive debts, and then only half of them are even in jobs that require a college degree. Um, I think we need to do something to bend the cost curve for higher education, and this might be a step in that direction. Change lives, change organizations, change organizations, change the world.